Hi there and welcome to workshop 5. So I've just loaded up the uh, Lab 5 worksheet and I noticed that it's after a pa package parsnip so I'm going to start by installing that. Again as I'm on a Linux box this is going to take um, a little bit longer than it might otherwise do because we're building from source. But in this case it looks as though they're all plain R packages, no source code to compile by the looks so it's reasonably quick. So slowly we've been installing the um, tidy models set of um, functions. So here we have um, th uh, four, fun four um, packages from tidy models, R sample, broom, yardstick and parsnip. Okay, so we're going to be looking at trees and forests today. So we'll run this initial code, which is basically just loading the packages, reading back in our computing data and splitting it in the same way as we did in uh, workshop four. And then we're going to start by fitting a regression tree model. So you remember a regression tree is essentially fitting a piecewise constant uh, function to the outcome variable. Um, and it does so by splitting the data repeatedly into, um, into sets of two. So what we do uh, first is we run through all of the uh, predictive variables and we run through all of the potential places in which to divide each of those predictive variables into two sets. So basically uh, split points where if uh, the predictor is less than a value you go left and if the predictor is greater than the value you go right uh, or vice versa. Um, and you run through all those possible uh, different ways to split the data and you find the one that reduces the uh, residual sum of squares. Uh, your prediction within each uh, node in the tree is just the mean of y, mean of the outcome variable, mean of the target. Uh, so we can fit them using R part. So you can see here that this is a familiar context where we're fitting a, using a um, the standard formula uh, syntax. So we're fitting um, the outcome for the target uh, user in terms of all other variables. And um, because this produces a tree, um, the best way to interrogate it is to actually look at the tree and see what it looks like. So the plot command and the text command together, they have to both be run at once, um, will produce the tree. So you can see here that the uh, first variable we split on is VFLT. And if it's greater than or equal to around 157, we go to the left. And if it's less than 157, we go to the right. So if this condition is satisfied, you go left. If it's not satisfied, you go right. Okay. Um, even if it's a less than. So if it's a less than, then if it's satisfied, you go left. Okay. So it's not, uh, we, we don't go left if it's smaller and bigger and right if it's greater. We go left if the condition is satisfied or not. Okay. Then if VFLT is even bigger than that, we go left again. And then if it's even bigger than that again, we go left. So you can see here that there's a decreasing relationship between VL, FLT and the outcome because if it's a very large number we eventually end up with a mean of 64 um, and if it's between 383 and 654 we go with 76.98 and if it's less than 383 then we make the call based on uh, the S call variable and then the VFLT variable um, again and this structure allows essentially for interactions between the various variables so you can see here we've got a condition on VFLT which is then conditioned on S core, which is then conditioned again on VFLT. So this condition down here on VFLT, that it's um, greater than or equal to 47.5, only happens if S core is less than 1330. Okay. Right, so there's our, our model. Um, so we've fit this with the default complexity parameter. So you remember that for trees, um, the complexity parameter basically defines the depth of the tree. So um, it's uh, shorthand is CP for complexity parameter and by default it's um, set to 0 0.01 which means that in order for a split to be included in the tree, so in order for, a, for another, another split to be added to the tree, we've got to improve the overall residual sum of squares by at least 0 0.01, so by 1%. Okay, so at this point in this tree, uh, there is no need to improve it, uh, no need to consider any more splits because all other splits that are possible from here uh, re um, reduce the, resi the uh, residual sum of squares by less than 1%. So that's our cutoff. But we can alter that. That's a tunable parameter. So in the second model here, we're going to, um, we're going to fit a new model which uh, 
is going to have a lower complexity. So we could have a look at that model just by spitting it out and you can see here's the structure of the tree. So at the root node we have 600 node, um, observations going in and the residual time of squares is this number here. Okay, and then we can improve it um, as we go. So including the split at the root node um, reduces the residual sum of squares um, down to 88.97%. And you can see that these are the uh, these ones that are in stars are the terminal nodes or leaves at each branch. Okay, so you can see it's a much more complicated tree. So we can see this by plotting it, obviously. So let's plot the tree. Um, so there's a couple of um, extra commands that you can do. So you can see up here I've specified margin. So let's try it without the margin, just so you can see what, what it looks like. Okay. Uh, you need both commands at once. Whoops, it's instead of tree, of course, it's text. To put the text on the tree. So you can see here that the, that it's cut off um, around the, the right and the bottom, so adding a little bit of margin is helpful. So you can see we've got a much more complicated tree here. Okay, with many, many more nodes down the bottom here. You can tune this a little bit, like you can change the size of the text and things with CEX. You know, this is base graphics, not ggplot, so it's a little bit more arcane. But there you go. All right. So you can see that the uh, the top of the tree is is pretty much the same, right? Um, because uh, you know this is this these are the optimal splits regardless of complexity. Um, but the more complex tree just, just goes further in the splitting. Okay, so it includes more variables in the splitting. Okay, so because we've got a tunable parameter here, the CP, then uh, the question is, um, you know, how can we optimize that? And you can optimize it a couple of ways. So one way you could do it is just by uh, trying lots and lots of values for CP. So pr perhaps trying a grid of values for CP, and then just um, fitting the model over and over and then evaluating predictive performance on a on the independent test set and choosing the CP value that minimizes that. But we can also do that via built-in cross-validation. So because the tree is filtering the observations um, uh, down the tree and this is a fairly efficient process, you can actually do this all by cross-validation um, and um, get an estimate of CP in that way. So the print CP value um, command prints out this table here, which basically tells you what your complexity value is at each val at, at each um, at the depth of the tree. So the n split is the number of splits. So this is a zero split tree. So um, so that tree uh, doesn't have any splits in it at all. It's just a single root node, um, which is basically just predicting the average, right? So that's predicting the mean of the outcome variable. Okay, and so that's why that has um, relative error one, um, because it has complete error, right? All of the residual sum of squares is just um, the variance that you'd get from predicting the mean. Okay, and then uh, this is the tree with this is the uh, tree with one split, so a single split at the root, and that reduces the error substantially, okay, by half. And you can see that the error improvement then reduces uh, quite a bit as we go down. And these are the various. Uh, CPs, so that's the bottom that we've gone for, which is the one we chose. Um, and uh, so we want to choose one that reduces the relative error, this column here, but this column here, the X error, is um, essentially the, the error from cross-validation. Yeah, um, so what we want is we want um, to, uh, to keep to sort of run down this chart here so that we keep improving things. Um, but we've always got to consider the amount of error in our um, in our estimate. Okay, so we typically choose the uh, the minimum C, the value of CP so that's within one standard error of the minimal value. So you can see here's the standard um, error. Okay, so basically um, the idea here is that this is the cross-validation error and this is its um, the standard error associated with it. So um, you can see that, say, this value here, you know, we're 0.183 plus 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 0.183 plus
plus or minus uh, twice the standard error, right? So uh, that's 0 0.03. So 0 0.03, it means that this number here is equivalent to this number way up here, right? Essentially an error, right? Because the difference between these two is about 0 0.03, which is about two standard standard errors. So typically uh, what we do is we find the, the lowest possible cross-validation error, which is in, the, in this column here, and I think it's going to be is it this one here is the lowest possible. And then we go up by about one standard uh, standard error from there. Okay, so we're going to add on about 0 0.014 to 0 0.180, so we'll get about 0.194-ish, so we're going to go up to about here, and that will be our, um, our CP. Okay, so that's kind of a rule of thumb method. So we can do that um, by taking that table that we spat out, converting it to a tibble, so that we can deal with it. Um, at the moment it's a matrix, I think. So converting it to a data frame or a tibble. And then we're um, creating uh, the limit, which is going to be the, um, the smallest value of x error plus one standard deviation. And then we're going to filter out such that the x error is below that limit. So let's run that. So here we go. So you can see that all of these um, splits from 14 onwards are essentially equivalent in terms of the amount of error that we're getting from the cross-validation process. Okay, so that's so essentially all of these CPs are equivalent, so we might as well deal uh, with the tree that is simplest. Okay, so it's essentially the bias variance trade-off, right? Um, so this criteria here is essentially how much error there is in the um, in the result from um, when we use cross-validation, so when we use, uh, I think it's tenfold cross-validation, so we take nine parts of the training data and we predict the remaining um, one-tenth of the training data. That's what we're using for estimating the, um, uh, the predictive performance in the model. And then we repeat that ten times with each of the ten um, subsets. Right? And so this is an, a measure of how much that variation uh, the, the variation across the across those that cross validation process, so it's giving us a, a measure of the of the variance contribution, and of course bias is going to decrease as we get more complex. So what we want to do is we want to choose the tree that is um, uh, that essentially is optimizing the bias variance trade off, right? So we're going to choose the simplest possible tree in order to reduce variance, um, but it's the uh, most complex of the, uh, it's the simplest of the of the most complex complex trees, if you like, right? So, the most complicated trees have very high variance. Uh, we'll, um, we'll see that later when we um, when we change the data a little bit. We'll get quite different looking trees. Okay, so we want to minimize the variance by choosing a simple tree, but we also don't want to choose a too simple tree because choosing a too simple tree will introduce bias, right? So we're finding a tree that's complex, but is simple in terms of the um, overall complexity, essentially is equivalent in terms of the um, overall error of the tree. So we should choose CP about 0 0.03, okay? Uh, now this process um, has a little bit of um, of uh, stochasticity in it, a little bit of randomness in it, um, because while the optimal split is chosen conditional on the training data, uh, you can get situations where um, there's essentially a, um, a sort of a 50-50 uh, situation. Uh, so you have two splits that basically improve things by, by the same amount. Um, and you've also got cross-validation, so you've got subsampling of the data coming in here. So depending on your random seed, you may get a different result here um, in this table than I did. That's okay. Um, uh, we'll just uh, just sort of soldier on. Uh, so sometimes, for example, when you run this, you might get quite different CPs, just because um, the way it split the data for the cross validation was a bit different. Okay. So instead of print CP, where we get this uh, table that's a little bit hard to interpret because you've got to sort of combine these values in order to estimate the sort of the optimal, um, you can use plot CP, uh, which does the same thing. Right. So this pre presents the um, the uh, relative error, okay, on the y-axis and the CP on the x-axis, and then has the limit. So that limit line there is once again it's found the uh, smallest possible um, cross-validation error, and it's added on one standard deviation to that. So you can see again that when it um, we choose a value such that it, um, 
it just dives below the limit line for the first time. So again, it's around 0.03 that we're going to around 0.003 that we're going to be um, that we're going to be going for. So let's refit the tree with that and take a look at the corresponding tree. So we're going to do a third model, uh, which is going to be our part in terms of all the variables with our training data. And we're going to use CP equals 0 0.003. So we'll get a um, a tree that's not quite as complex as before, right? Because our complexity isn't as high as it was. And there it is there. Okay, so this is sort of a middle ground between the three trees that we have, uh, the, the two trees that we had before. Okay, again, this is going to be a subset of that high that um, the tree with CP equals 0 0.001 because that tree's just gone and split things a little bit further. Okay, so that's how we build trees. How do we evaluate their performance? Um, then one way to do it is via cross validation. Okay, um, so that's one way we could potentially tune the CP parameter, but we could also um, assess the performance on the independent test set that we have. So we've got an artificial test, test set where we know the answer. So we could compare these models on uh, that test set. Now unfortunately there's not a nice um, cleaner in Broom uh, for um, tree-based models. There's one being developed called Broomstick, um, but it's not, um, uh, it's, it's not uh, finished yet. So instead we're going to use the predict function just like we did for li the linear model. It's just uh, the difference is that this just returns a vector. Okay so again we have 200 rows, um, one prediction per row in the test set which of course had 200 observations. So you can see that up here. Okay um, so we're going to um, take the comp test data and we're going to bind a, um, a new column fitted, which is going to be our prediction. And then we're going to pull everything out. So here you have your, uh, our true uh, user variable in the, in the artificial test set, and the, here's our fitted value from the model. And you can see here that these correlate reasonably well, okay, um, and that we get higher numbers when we tend to have higher truth. So that's nice. And once we have that um, uh, data frame set up where we've got the fitted value and the, and the, um, and the truth, we can then uh, compute the difference, square it, and then compute the mean in the same way as we did um, last time. So we can compute the mean square error is just the mean of the difference between fitted and user squared. Okay, so we can compute the uh, means for the same for the other two models. So this was for the most simple one. Um, above but we can do the same thing so let's do that for model 2 and model 3 okay okay and in fact we could do it uh, all at once couldn't we uh, we could just bind two columns here Notice that the select here is just reordering things so that when I um, when I spat it out, because by default um, bind column would put the fitted column at the end, uh, but because the user variable is on the left, I'm pulling out, uh, well I'm, actually I'm not sure where the user variable is, but I want them on the left so I can see them, right? So I'm pulling the user variable out, the fitted variable out, then everything else. Um, so what am I doing here? I'm combining uh, two fitted variables. So I could have fitted 2 and fitted 3. We could put fitted 1 in there as well, I suppose, couldn't we? And then we've got all of them next to each other. And we can compare them all at once. Okay, and then we could go fitted 1, fitted 2, fitted 3. Okay, whoops, uh, let's just call this comp. Compred all maybe, maybe compred RP because we'll be doing some other things later. Okay, we can have a look at that. Okay, so these are the three predictions. 
from the three different trees. Okay, and then we could, of course, uh, compute the mean square error. Uh, summarize um, MSC1 is going to be a mean of user minus dot fitted one squared. MSC2 is going to be the same thing. And MSC3 is going to be the same thing. All right, so we have one, two, and three. So there are the three mean square errors. So you can see here that um, in this case, the uh, the simplest tree and the more complex tree are actually very, very similar. The more complex tree is actually doing slightly worse than the simplest tree, but the best tree here is the the one in the middle, the 0 0.03. Okay, and it's quite an improvement. So there's quite a bit of benefit for playing around with the complexity of the tree in some cases. Um, notice that I could have done this all at once. So the alternate to, to running uh, this command here would be to take advantage of the um, of the across verb in dplyr. So this is for um, doing the same computation across multiple columns, right? So we're going to say across um, the fitted columns. So we could either go fitted one, fitted two, or fitted three. We could do that. Or we could go starts with dot fitted. So across those columns, what we want to do is we want to run a function, and that function is going to be computing the mean of the the user variable minus whatever we're passing into the function squared. Okay, now this syntax looks a bit strange. Let me break it down for you a little bit. So we're running summarize, then across. Okay, and then the across um, argument takes the columns that we want to run across. So those are things that start with the word fitted, which has got to be in quotes. So it's not a name of a column. And then we're running an anonymous function here. So an anonymous function has the syntax um, tilde to, to tell it that it's going to be a function. And then the argument is either dot or dot x. You can decide what you want. Okay, so across the columns starting with fitted, we're running this function here which is the difference between user and whatever's passed into the function, which will be fitted, uh, which will be the three columns here. So when we run that, we get the same result. Okay, so that's just a little bit of um, syntactical sugar, if you like. And nothing wrong with this, right? This is understandable and um, not too much typing, right? It's mostly copy and paste. So there's nothing wrong with doing this. But when you have very many models, um, this starts to become um, a slightly more efficient way of doing things. Uh, we'll see later on uh, an even better way of doing this um, is to actually use bind rows instead of um, bind columns. So instead of binding each of our predictions into a different column, we bind them all into a single single row and just duplicate the rest of the data because then we can just group by the model and do our summary. Okay. So let's use yardstick instead and again our studio has been a pain okay um, try using yardstick right so we're going to be our comp prid rp again which has all my predictions in it and i'm going to use um, rmec uh, truth is the user variable and my estimate is uh, dot fitted one so there's the root mean square error, and I could do that for each one, couldn't I? So there they are there. Um, so again, you know, model two is the best, and we could also compute the um, the MAE as well. So you can see um, when they're in columns, this is a bit awkward. Right, because I have to um, have a different um, and again the uh, second model is the best there 
you know, I have to have a different set of code uh, per per model. Whereas if these were in rows, I could just group by the model and then run this once. Okay. Now there's a um, these metrics is a useful um, command which just combines all of the metrics for evaluating model fit. So we've got the root mean square error, the R square, and the mean absolute error. So the R squared is of course just the proportion of variance explained model to model. So that works the other way, right? So um, when we get fitted two, we'll get a higher R squared, right? And a lower uh, root mean square error and a lower mean absolute error because this model is fitting the data better. It's explaining the data better, okay? So we'll see later how to, how to get all this um, a little bit um, nicer, okay? So there's our trees. Now we're going to have a look at what happens when we change the data to include missingness. Because one of the great things about trees is they can in fact deal with missing data. Because at each split, um, if your variable is missing for a data point, you can just work out another split that would work in its place. So a surrogate split. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our um, training data, which we know is complete, and we're going to uh, change the VFLT column to have missing values for the first five rows. So you can see here, if the row number is less than five, I'm going to set it to NA, otherwise I'm going to set it to VFLT. So let's run that and have a look. So you can see that the first five rows there, I've made VFLT empty. Now, you may not have seen this NA real here before, um, and that's just the specific version of a missing value that is um, a uh, a real number. So if you if you tried this code with just NA, then it'll freak out because NA by default is logical, so it's a true false. Um, whereas NA real is a floating point number. Okay, or a real number. Okay, so if you get the error um, when you're using the if else operator, it's just because the two cases here. So uh, this this is the true case. Uh, if that expression is true, it uses this case, and this is the false case. Both of those cases need to be of the same type, okay, in order to, for, if, for if else uh, to work. There is another version of if, if else without the underscore, and that one will work with the NA. So that's more permissive. It'll give you the exact same answer without spitting an error at you, okay? So just to be aware of that, um, that some of the functions, this is a tidy version of the if else function in dplyr. Um, you can see these all of these different versions of NA. So there's NA, which is logical, NA real, which is a uh, floating point number, a real number, NA integer, which is a whole number, NA complex, which is a complex number with real and imaginary parts, NA character for a character strings. So we want NA real here. Okay. So now um, let's um, refit the tree using uh, the data with the missing values in it, um, using the same it's frustrating. Using the same complexity parameter. So we're going to go model uh, four. So we're going to take our part, user in terms of dot, data equals comp train miss, cp equals 0 0.003. Okay. And if we have a look at the output from that model, uh, you can see it's fit a tree before. And if we run the summary command on it, it gives us even more information. You get all of the uh, the CP table, and then you get um, a lot more information about each node. Okay, so this is the first node, which has 600 observations, so that's all of it, and that complexity parameter. Then you can see you've got your primary split, which is the one that is at the top of the tree. It's the same split that we had before. And notice that there's five missing values there. Okay, the second uh, split to consider would be to split on PFLT instead. Okay, uh, which 
doesn't improve things by as much. So the improvement here is the improvement in the um, in the uh, as a as a proportion of mean square error. So this improves things by 53%. Um, if instead we split on PFLT, we wouldn't get the same improvement. It would only improve things by 0.509, um, but there wouldn't be any missing values. Okay. So instead what we do is we split on VFLT because that improves things from the mo by the most, but then for those five missing values, we choose an alternate. And the best alternate, based on only those five missing values, is the surrogate split, which splits all five. Okay, so um, when we have missing values, we don't just consider the, um, the, the best possible split, but we consider the, the best possible split conditional on whether things are missing or not. So for all of the values such that they're not missing, VFLT is the best. So that's for 595 observations. But the, the five for which VFLT is missing, we're going to split on PFLT and we're going to um, decide based on a different criteria than even the other primary split. So if we were considering all 600 observations, we would split on PFLT less than 98. But because we're only considering the five for which VFLT is missing, we're going to split on PFLT less than 92.2. And if there were missing values there, we would go to the next surrogate split and so on. Okay. And then we go down for the, the, the second split here. Um, we again split on VFLT and there's still one missing, so we're going to use fork for that one. Okay, so that's how surrogate splits work in the tree. Okay, look at all that output that it spits out. Isn't that annoying? Okay. Now, let's have a look at the tree. Oh, I've just done all this, haven't I? Let's write the code for it then. So the tree looks the same as the other ones. All right, we're still splitting on VFLT first and then side splitting here and so on. Um, potentially these splits could differ um, from before, but I think they look almost the same. And then we've looked at the summary, so we'll, we'll just transfer that down there. Right, so if VFLT is missing, then a surrogate split using PFL used if less than 92.2 then we then we go the same way as we would have with VFLT okay right so that's trees now the problem with trees is that they can be um, they can be very unstable. So there's an example in the notes on this um, where we take um, the uh, data set in the notes, which uh, what's that one? Is it the Italian wine data? Let's have a let, let me have a quick look. find it for you. So here are the notes and if we go down to prediction and look at regression trees. Uh, no, it's the wage data isn't it, of course. And so you can see down here when we start looking at forests uh, just before we look at forests, what we do is we have a little piece on tree instability. Okay, so trees are basically brittle, and you can sort of see that when you ha when you have a look at um, data. So let's um, have a look at this data set here. Where's a bigger plot of it? This one here. So here is a relationship that's clearly non-linear, right? So a linear model is never going to uh, fit well to this data. You'd have to transform the outcome variable um, before you or at least transform the x variable before you try to fit a, fit a linear model to this. But um, you can see here that where you split 
particularly when the complexity gets high. So this is going to be a very simple tree. We've only split into two places, so you get a piecewise linear function. Um, but later on we split into a more complex version. Let's have a look at that down here. So if you have a look at this, for example, we've split it uh, many more times. So we've got a very complicated tree. And you can see here that if you just move some of the data points a little bit, you're going to get a very different splitting point and therefore a very different tree. So trees are brittle. You change the data just a little bit and you get something that looks very different. So that's what this example down here uh, gives. So we take the wage data and we just resample it uh, with a bootstrap. So we just uh, sample the rows uh, with replacement. So we get another 400 rows from the same data set, just picking out 400 random ones, um, allowing them to be chosen more than once if that's what the random number generator wants. And you can see that when you do that, the two data sets are essentially the same. They look the same, right? They've got the same distribution of the wage in terms of the various predictive variables. So you'd expect the trees to be similar, but the trees in fact are very different. So there's the tree from the bootstrapped um, data. So you can see the first split, split is, ed is edu, and then we've got a split on union and occupation. Whereas in the original data, if you have a look at the tree, uh, your first split is occupation. Okay, so it's instead of education. And so this tree has age and sex and married in it. Whereas this one down here, uh, age appears in the tree, but sex does not, and nor does married. And instead, uh, we've got south showing up in the tree. Okay. So the two trees are quite different, even though they're trained on the same data, just being resampled. Okay, so the trees are brittle. So they're unstable. And so um, this can make them potentially poor estimators. Uh, now, the advantage of a tree, of course, is it's easy to explain. It's a decision tree, right? You can explain how the observations move through the tree, and you can correlate that, exp um, that explanation with the size of the outcome variable, for example, right? So you can see here that the, the, that, um, you know, the, the, the biggest dollars occur um, if you've had more education on this side of the tree than if you've had less, except for... Um, you know, certain cases, like if you're in a union, you get more money, for example. And it depends on your occupation, so on and so forth, your age, lots of things, right? And you can sort of, you can explain what's happening in the tree, and it makes sense from a making a decision perspective. But it is brittle. So it's not necessarily good purely for prediction. So what we can do in that case is why not run, why not do the bootstrapping, like we did here, and get two different trees, and then average the outcome. So combine the two trees in our predict prediction. And that's what forests do. Okay, so forests essentially um, take the data and bootstrap it many, many times. So resample the data lots of times in order to get lots of different trees. And then uh, average across your, our predictions across all those different trees. And the idea is that you end up looking at the data uh, from a lot of different angles, because each time you look at it, you've got a slightly different bootstrap sample. And so some variables will be more important than others in that bootstrap sample. And it does it further by actually um, just allowing at each split, instead of cons considering every variable in the data, you only consider a subset. So at each split, you actually subsample the data, the, the columns, and you uh, only choose, say, a third of them in order to, con to uh, figure out what the splits, best split's going to be. And you do that randomly to add even more randomness into the trees. And you do this across many, many trees, say 500 or 1,000 trees, and then you average. And, the, and what you end up doing is looking at the data from lots of different um, directions, and therefore, um, hopefully, um, because you've looked at the data from lots of different directions, when you come to predict on a new independent set, if it perhaps has a slightly different combination than the main uh, set of variables, instead of just looking at the general trend, you, you've, you've been able to look at that specific trend in, in a bunch of your trees, and so you can then do reasonable prediction from it. 
the idea is that the prediction from the average of all the trees will be better than the prediction from any one of them. So we implement that using the random forest package. Okay, uh, so that's done here. And there's a couple of things that we can then um, uh, look at across all the trees. So when, you, when we were looking at a single tree, we could um, we could get a feel as, as, as to what is the most important variable by just looking at the top of the tree, right? The most important variable is the thing that we use to split first. And then the, le the less important variables are the ones that appear further down in the tree. Okay, um, and we can do that same idea except now we've got 500 trees or a thousand trees or something. So what we could do is look at how often do we get a good improvement in the tree fits um, by using a certain variable across all our trees, right? So that's um, importance, um, which you can compute using importance, and you get a, a, a chart here um, which um, gives you a score. Okay, so you can see here that the top score variables here are VFLT and PFLT, which were the top score variables in the tree as well, right? Remember that VFLT was the one we split on first, and if we couldn't split on that, we were going to use PFLT. And some of the other variables like S-Core we, we used and Fork we used, which are also quite important uh, across lots of trees. And you can do a plot of that data with var imp plot. Okay, and you get the same thing but in graphical form. So you can see here that VFLT, PFLT, Fork, S-Core and Exec are all the important variables across all of those trees. Okay, so we can compute predictions in the same way as we could before. So let's compute a prediction for this model. Uh, so we're going to go random forest uh, one, maybe, because I think we'd be doing another one. So we're going to take our test, our test data, and we're going to bind a column to it, which is going to be predict uh, from our model. on our test set um, and we'll maybe just pull the user and the dot fitted column out to the left so that we can look at it uh, bind columns of course right we can have a look at that so again, you get good correlation, right, between the fitted value and the user value, and we can compute the mean square error in the same way. Uh, user minus dot fitted square. So the mean square error is quite a lot lower. 5.7 um, and before the best we could do was about 9 wasn't it so we've improved things dramatically by using a forest and that's generally I think what you'll uh, what you'll tend to find um, when you uh, fit uh, random forests uh, they do tend to be uh, my go-to um, but you know on some prediction problems they don't work very well and so you may need to use something uh, something else for example if a uh, linear model is going to fit the data well it will almost certainly do better than a random forest will simply because you can utilize the power of the linear model right if the linear model assumptions hold it will be the most powerful model and so it will give you the best fit but if they don't if the relationship's not particularly linear then perhaps a forest will work better Okay, it's far more flexible, and it's combining the positives of the tree, in a, trees being able to fit um, things like interactions, and trees being able to fit um, nonlinear functions, with the disadvantages of the trees, which is the um, brittle nature and the unstable nature, it sort of takes advantage of that by fitting many, many trees um, and averaging across them. Okay, now there's a couple of parameters that we might like to play with. Um, so those are um, M, try, and node size. So we could try fitting a different model. Um, so we could go uh, 
model 2.rf maybe where we fit a random forest we'll user in terms of dot and we could try m try m try and node size so node size by default for a prediction problem is five and that's the smallest possible um, the smallest number of observations at a node in a tree um, before a split is allowed so we could try reducing that to one so essentially each of these trees then would be grown, grown to maximal depth so there'd be no pruning of any of the trees um, so they'll be very very complex but that's not necessarily a disadvantage uh, because while it adds more variance um, because we're averaging over many many trees we're going to be reducing the variance that we're that we're adding in uh, m try then is the number of variables that are tried at each um, at each split um, so we remember we've got 21 variables here um, so we might try maybe reducing it to say four so we'll only use four variables I think this defaults to the number of predictors over three so it will be defaulting to seven in this in this case so let's try that and see what happens um, and then we'll evaluate our predictive performance Right, so we'll use our second model and then we'll evaluate our fit just to see what happens uh, and we get a pretty similar mean square error slightly worse okay so our tuning here has, has is, is not the best notice that we get a different result each time I run it and that's because this is a random forest right it does depend on the uh, the seed. So if I set seed here to some number, then at least it'll be consistent. Right? And of course we don't want to be choosing a model based on a random seed. Okay, um, so that's standard tree and um, and forest prediction. Um, now we're going to have a look at tidying this up a little bit um, using the tidy models framework so this is the same way to fit a tree down here um, to fit a decision tree a regression tree um, and to do prediction in the tidy models framework now in this uh, in the case of lm r part and random forest um, we've seen that the way that we fit the model is essentially the same across all three we, pa we pass it a formula we pass it the training data and then we have some potential uh, for some tuning parameters right with our part we've got the CP with random forest we've got M try and node size right so the procedure is fit the model and then do prediction and the prediction was done in the same way right it was always done with predict um, uh, the predict function uh, with the same syntax so there's not a huge advantage here of switching to some other form but we'll see when we go on to do classification later and for some other model types um, the sort of form that you use to fit the model um, with the standard fitting function can change often so for example when we do classification sometimes instead of taking a, form a formula it will take a um, an x y combination so it will take a y for the outcome variable which is just a vector and an x which would be some design matrix um, for the uh, covariates um, and sometimes it might do the prediction and the and the um, model fitting all in one function. So you just run one function and it gives you some out. Uh, you pass it the test data and the and the training data all at once. Um, sometimes um, the form of the training data has to be quite specific. So you've got to process the data first before you can throw it in to the fitting function. So there's lots of different. Um, techniques or different uh, structures for fitting uh, models in R okay and that's basically just based on the decisions of whoever wrote the code that fits the models right generally they do follow a pattern um, but sometimes they don't okay and so there's been a lot of work and this is what the tidy models framework is for for essentially um, coercing each of the different possible ways of fitting models into a common framework so that you 
so that the users of that framework don't need to remember all of the esoteric details and can instead use the same pattern for fitting model, multiple model types with multiple packages. So for example, with the random forest, um, uh, we've been using the random forest package, but there's at least two other packages that we could have used. For example, we could have used Ranger, um, which is another common package for fitting random forests. But if you use Ranger, then the parameters you use aren't M, try and node size. Instead, they're something else. Okay, so um, you know you've got to know the the particular uh, functional form that you've got to spit it in. You know, do you put a formula syntax? Do you put a Y and an X? You've also got to know the name of all the parameters um, that you, that you can tune. And so uh, the tidy models framework. Uh, has been constructed so that those things that you need to know are minimized. So it takes a fitting function that is always the same form. It handles the details of converting the formula syntax to the X and the Y. If it needs an X, if the underlying fitting function that's used needs a Y and an X, then the um, tidy models framework will convert your formula syntax into the appropriate Y and X for the data. Um, it also standardizes the names. So for example, with a random forest, um, you've got the uh, M try parameter and the node size parameter. They're standardized, right? So that um, whether you use ranger or the random forest, uh, the name of the parameter is going to be the same and it will convert the name of the parameter into whatever the random forest or ranger or whatever other um, forest fitting function it's going to use so that the, it's consistent across different uh, fitting engines. So the structure is the same, right? It's basically a four step process. You start by specifying the model. You then fit the model to training data and you then do your prediction and then you compute your model fit on the training data with some metrics. Okay, so to fit a decision tree with the tidy models framework, the specification is decision tree. Um, it has a different, it has a mode. So in this case, we're going to want um, a regression mode because you can also use decision trees for classification and other things as well. And then it's got a set of parameters that you can pass in, one of which is the cost complexity, which is the CP parameter. Okay, so in this case, we're putting it it, the, um, it equal to 0 0.01 and when I run this all it does is create a specification and I could translate that specification and it will give me the underlying model fit so what it's actually going to do here is it's going to run our part with a formula and some data and some weights um, all of which are missing they'll be filled in later uh, when we, we, in this course we're not going to be doing uh, weighted uh, regression trees um, but you can see that it's correctly translated the cost complexity parameter into CP. Now there are other engines for fitting um, decision trees and each of those engines would have a different um, function that it's, that it's using and potentially a different translation. Okay. So once we've set up our model specification that we want to use a decision tree, we then fit the model. And this is always the same across all um, model specifications. So we could change the decision tree here to a linear regression and we would use the same code here. Okay, so we always use the fit routine which passes a formula syntax and a some training data. Right, so that does the model fit. Okay, once we've done the model fit we can use prediction. So again we have a predict command this predict command operates on our tree fit in the same way that we would expect. Uh, the new data argument has an underscore in it. That's the only difference. Okay. Um, and the thing is, uh, the difference between this predict and the underlying predict function for our part or random forest or whatever, is this takes care of, um, of the fact that it always returns a data frame with a single column or a data frame with a particular set of columns. So for example, you can add in um, prediction intervals and stuff like that here if you if you want. So it works a bit like Broom Augment. In fact, you can use Augment here if you want to. 
Um, and it deals with things like missing values. Okay, so the underlying predict function for RPART or for LM or for random forest doesn't deal nicely with missing values. So if you have missing values in your data and if the uh, underlying model cannot deal with them, so for example, if you have a tree for which you don't have surrogate splits available for those missing values, or you have a linear model where of course you can't do prediction with uh, missing values, then what it will do is it will just not give you a prediction for that observation. So that if you know the, the uh, third row in your data has missing values in it, then you will not get a third row. Instead, the fourth row will be in the third row's position. So you can't, uh, you can't line up your predictions with your test data very well if you've got missing values. Okay, you need to take care of the missing values yourself first before applying the predict function so that everything matches up. Uh, the predict function in tidy models takes care of that for you. So it's one less thing to worry about. Okay, so let's run that. So you can see here that the tr tree prediction here, we have our user, we have our dot .prid function uh, column, which is always named dot .prid. You never have to remember what the name of it is because it's always named the same thing. So you have to remember that it's dot .prid, but it's always dot .prid, right? Um, and then we can run um, our metrics function from yardstick to give our root mean square, our r squared, and our mean absolute error. So the process is always the same. One, specify the type of model. So um, set up the model specification, fit the model with fit, predict the model with predict, use metrics to evaluate the prediction. Okay. And from now on, we'll probably pretty much be using the tidy models framework. Okay, so let's um, try modifying the above. And of course, we can do that just by modifying the specification. Right, so we can easily change the specification, change the cost complexity parameter to say to 0 0.03, 0, 0, 0.03, and then the rest of the code is the same. Right, so I'm just gonna make it, put a two on everything. But it hasn't changed. Whoops, I missed something up here. Whoops, comp test two, of course we don't have. We just have same test data. Okay, and there's our different prediction. Uh, now, the, the only disadvantage of this method is that the tree fit object isn't actually the R part object. Okay, it's a, um, it's a model object um, from the parsnip package. So if we want to, for example, do um, have, a, have, a, have a look at things, say, you know, you've got a linear model and you want to do a summary, Okay, then you can have a look at the object and you see that it's a parsnip model object. It's not an R part, but it does have the R part stuff there. Okay, so that means that things like um, uh, plot CP may not work on this object, right? It doesn't know because it's not a legitimate R part object. Okay, so to get the underlying fit engine, you use um, extract fit engine. Right, so we could do take our tree fit, extract the fit engine, and then do our plot CP. Okay, so if you do need to look at the object, you use extract fit engine to pull it out. Okay, uh, so we can switch the above to use linear regression instead. Right, so we use the same four steps. but we're going to have a linear model spec. And instead of using the decision tree, we're going to use linear regression. And of course, it doesn't need cost complexity. So we could put other arguments there if we wanted to. Um, I don't think there really are any others for linear regression. We could have a look at the help if we want. Um, you can see that it can fit a linear model with a lot of different engines, so we're going to be using LEM, but there's all of these other ones. Okay, uh, and in this argument, there's various arguments, so you can use a penalty, there's mixture um, for uh, various, you know, for, for fitting um, different penalties. So this is for lasso or ridge regression, if you've heard of those. Don't worry if you haven't. 
Right, so uh, the procedure is the same. Uh, we're going to specify a linear regression. We're going to then fit it using our training data. We're then going to uh, predict it on our on our uh, using our model fit, and then compute our metrics. Okay, so there's the linear prediction there. So you can see that actually does a reasonable job, right? Um, it's certainly does better than our tree was doing. Um, or we could use a random forest. Okay. The same setup applies. So we could use a random forest spec. So we're going to use a rand forest. Again, it's going to be in regression mode and we're going to use an engine. So the default engine for random forest is the ranger engine. Um, and we might want to tune the M try parameter. Uh, so we make that say, let's try, let's try three. And min n, which is the node size parameter. Uh, let's make that two say. All right, so we could ha uh, translate that engine to see what it's doing. Okay, you can see that it's running random forest. Okay, and that it's used uh, M try as the as the minimum um, minimum columns between uh, three and the number of columns of of our X data set. Uh, that's because, of course, M try can't be more uh, can't be um, can't be higher than the number of columns. M try, you remember, is the number of variables that it uses um, that it considers um, for uh, each split, and the node size is the minimum number of rows and uh, the minimum between the number of rows and uh, the number two, right? Because again, you can't have the node size equal to um, a number larger than the number of rows you have in your data set, because of course it can't possibly satisfy that condition. Okay, right. Let's then do the model fit in the same way as usual. Okay, um, again, we could, we could pull out that information so we could have a look at it uh, we could um, extract the fit engine in order to run a variable importance plot right so there are the important variables uh, this time around and then we could do prediction in the usual way and we could evaluate our model metrics. Okay, so here you can see uh, the linear model is still doing better than the forest. Okay, and that's just because for this data, a lot of the relationships are actually quite linear. Okay, so it um, the linear model with its um, with its uh, higher requirements on the type of data. Right, the linearity assumption, the uh, equal variance assumption, the independence assumption, the normality assumption, when those things are satisfied, then it's going to do really well. If those things aren't satisfied, it's going to do really poorly. Okay. So uh, let's just knit this and make sure it all works. <laughs> 